Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court. Stephen Dockery on behalf of Appellant Juan Jose Paramo. Appellant raises three questions for the Court today, none more important than this one. Is 28 U.S.C. 1782 a rubber stamp process, or is it a process that requires a genuinely adverse briefing and argument, and then a reasoned engagement with the 1782 factors, and then the factors uh, set down by the Supreme Court in Intel? Could we discuss jurisdiction quickly before we get yes, to this, this argument that you have? Um, you know, we have cases that say we lack jurisdiction if the scope of discovery might be altered in the district court. Is there any pending motion to quash in the district court that might deprive us of our jurisdiction? Uh, uh, or is there any dispute on the scope of the discovery that's still pending, that, so therefore this isn't yet appropriately before us? So I, I believe the um, appellant has, has responded, and uh, then um, the, the petitioner has, has moved to compel, and that, that motion is still pending. So, Does that affect our jurisdiction? I do not believe the court is deprived of its jurisdiction because it's the original grant of the subpoena that is being contested here, uh, rather than um, some, some type of mootness that would be raised. If, if petitioner was um, uh, moved to compel and provided responses, then, then I believe at that point. Uh, but if you, were, if, if you win the compel motion, and, and you're not moved to compel, then, then does that mean we wouldn't really have jurisdiction if you win on your compel? If, we if, they're, if they're trying to compel and you don't want to be compelled, and what if the district court agrees with you? Um, correct. I, I think, then I think it, it, it goes to the, uh, the use of the answers that have been provided. Okay, so there is already something that you think was wrong, so that that would be correct, Your Honor. Okay, that's right. And and so our, our argument is there's a, a line of cases um, after Intel from this court that started with uh, Ecuadorian plaintiffs, then to Texas Keystone, and then Banco Pueyo. And Ecuadorian plaintiff says there has to be an adverse proceeding in the 1782 process. Texas Keystone says there has to be an opportunity to be heard. And Benko Puyo says, not only does it have to be an opportunity to be heard, we know these are ex parte proceedings sometimes, but even after the ex parte grant, there needs to be a genuine engagement and adverse process and a reasoned uh, engagement with the law about how the court's ruling. We believe we did not receive that here. In this case, uh, the ex parte application was granted, a motion to quash was made, and a motion to deny a response was filed, and then before a reply was, was able to be filed under the, under the court's local rules, uh, the, the court ruled in a four-line order, which is on uh, page 547, pending before this court is respondent Juan Jose Paramo's motion opposing 17, 1782 application and motion to quash Benorte Sapina. After reviewing the motion, the response, the record, and the applicable law, the court is, is of the opinion that it should be denied. Okay, if, you know, they, there is a provision under 7.4 to allow you to file a, a, this reply, but you, what, the, but, but what if we disagree that the failure to giving you a reply brief uh, requires a reversal? Do, do you, do, could you still win on the order itself being insufficient? Yes, Your Honor. I, I, so I, I believe that, that is the, really the third issue, is whether the, the local court's failure to follow, the district court's fail, failure to follow its local rules amounts to an abuse of discretion. There's still the Banco Pueyo mandate, which is there has to be a genuinely adverse process, and then what I, I believe is implied by Banco Pueyo, and then also I think stated in, in WIWA, which is there should be some type of reasoning. Uh, we, we don't know what the court believed the relevant law was, how the court construed the relevant law, what the court believed the relevant facts were, or how the court applied the relevant law to the relevant facts. If we found the order insufficient, um, just assuming argument though, this is not foreshadowing, should we send the case back to the district court or should we uh, analyze the merits of the 1782 
I would argue that uh, the reverse and remand would be uh, the correct way, and that was what was done in Banco Puyo and Ecuadorian plaintiffs and, and the other 1782 cases. Because otherwise it puts this course in, it, court in the position of, of doing de, no, de novo review on potentially all of the 1782 So both Banco Pueyo 1 and 2 and Texas Keystone did that. Is that right? I believe, yes. I, I, I believe that, I, I know Banco Pueyo reverse and remanded. I, I believe that's the case with Texas Keystone, but I'm, I am not certain at this moment. Um, and, and we did also raise the, the Rule 45 challenge to the burden, burdensomeness of the subpoena. So it is at this court's um, discretion as to whether it would want to reform the subpoena, uh, the, the requested set of documents under Rule 45, because that, that is also a power, power of the court to, to uh, if it, it was in, in the interest of judicial economy. Here, I believe, because there are uh, four factors, Intel has kind of mandated the court's be a, a gatekeeper to, uh, for foreign, for, for, before foreign plaintiffs get access to domestic discovery, uh, that the appropriate gatekeeper here to is establish the record, go through uh, the, the voluminous um, uh, petition and, and responses and affidavits would be the district court. So then this court has something to review to, de to determine if abuse of discretion was made. What brilliant thing would have been said in the reply brief that wasn't already said? I, in the reply, the reply, reply brief specifically would be about the criminal proceeding in Mexico, which um, the uh, applicant initiated, and this was this was highlighted in the uh, initial brief and then responded to, and so I think the reply the re reply brief is an essential component of the adverse briefing. Um, whether that we would have lots of situations where we don't, how can it be an essential component? Uh, we have lots of times where we don't allow reply briefs at all. Yes, yes, and and uh, I I believe I do not think that in every circumstance a reply brief is required. I think here with the local rules uh, being as they are and adverse uh, briefing being required without a hearing being held by the by the district court. I believe that indicates that there was no genuinely adverse proceeding. So the, rep the failure to file a reply, reply, brief, repri reply brief is one indicia of the lack of adversity, but then also the lack of a hearing and the lack of a reasoned dec decision also indicate that as well. Is it, is it enough for the district court to have referenced the, the motion, which would have been the motion to quash, the response? And it says the record and the applicable law. I mean, it's very bare bones, but is it enough to basically, I mean, you can definitely read the order to say, I'm agreeing with uh, the petitioner's response, and I'm going to deny the motion to quash, which is to uphold the subpoena. I, I believe the problem that poses is it puts this court in the position of not knowing whether the court has abided by Banco Pueyo, which w that had a motion to quash. They denied the motion to quash, but the court said, no, 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 it's not just about the motion to quash. You have to reassess the, the four factors of the 1782 petition. So um, without some citation to law, and we, and we have a lot of very interesting uh, cases from district courts in Ray Turkey, one and two, Okean and Federal Republic of Nigeria, and they're very lengthy opinions uh, from the district courts about how the factors apply. I'm not saying we need that in every case, but there has to be at least some indi indication of what the court believes the law is, otherwise review is almost impossible. Hmm. With that, I, the, the other two issues... That, uh, answer who has the threshold standard for the burden of proof. There seems to be tension between 1782 versus the federal rule of civil procedure. Do we need to... Do we need to resolve that today? I don't believe so, I, and I don't believe that uh, that issue was was fully briefed below. Um, but it, oh, it's kind of a new thing here for us. And that if you went back to the district court to say, "Give us a fulsome order," you would argue this point about the 1782 burden of proof for the motion of quash being. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And and, and it, to to highlight our, our our conundrum here is we. The, the appellant below raised the, the third and fourth intel factors, colorable claims of the third and fourth intel factors regarding circumvention of proof gathering restrictions and the burdensomeness of the subpoena, which seeks uh, six years of documents regarding every communication made by the company 
uh, in Mexico in a foreign language. And uh, without any de determination of how those facts uh, would apply to the law and why the subpoena should be granted, we, have, we are not in a, a great position to argue before this court uh, without asking for a de novo review of, of the petition and asking the court to, to get into the details. Unless the court has any other questions, I'll reserve. Well, oh, sure. What about the that the mutual legal assistant treaties aren't really an option here? I, I believe they are, Your Honor. I think w w when you have a, um, especially when you have a criminal proceeding in a but foreign the minority country. parties are private. Yes, but, but they've initiated a, a criminal proceeding in, in Mexico. And uh, as as is often the case, and so there 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 is this um, unusual circumstance. They qualify when they've issued when they've helped to initiate the criminal proceeding. I, I, I don't the, know the answer to that. Under question. the U.S. Department of Justice mutual assistance, it's it's unclear, isn't it? It's unclear, and I, I think uh, the record below establishing who's actually the party in interest and and how they relate to the the civil and the criminal proceeding would be a uh, illuminating thing for both the district court to rule on and for this court to review in its uh, in the appeal. Okay. Does does Paramo have an estimate of the financial burden? Was that in the briefing, either to the district court or to us? There, there's no um, a specific dollar amount. Uh, we just know would, would know that the the swath of information would be hundreds of thousands of documents. You know, it's, it's a cardboard company that existed for 25 years, uh, conducting business uh, with companies like Anheuser Busch and and other things like that. And and so it would be all funds. Uh, let's see here. Um, any and all documents between between you, invoices, payments. Vendors, creditors, debtors. Uh, this is on page 316 and 317. All of all documents relating to your bank accounts and assets, your tax returns, under all transfers. Under Intel money. factors, I'm sorry, I'm just cognizant of the time. Yes. Uh, under the Intel factors, would you have to have these translated? Because if they're going to be used in the Mexican court proceeding, it may seem, is that really a necessary factor in this case? I don't believe the under the intel factors, but I believe under the counsel's responsibility to his client in in the domestic proceeding, they they would have to know what they're providing. I think a unknowing provision of potentially privileged documents to another side would would uh, account, uh, amount the to the U.S. counsel would not be doing its his his their duty. duty exactly. Okay. Let me ask you one: uh, Does the district court have to reanalyze? Uh, reanalyze the substantive 1782 factors when subsequently faced with a motion to quash a subpoena. Yes, Your Honor. I believe that's exactly what's required in Banco Puyo. Is well, that, is that it, not a duplicative of the first 1782 analysis? I, no, and, and I think that the court made clear that, that um, the touchstone of, of Banco Puyo and the touchstone of, of litigation is, in the end, our entire jurisprudence runs counter to the notion of court action taken before reasonable notice and an opportunity to be heard has been granted both sides of a dispute. So I unless you have a genuine adversity and, and uh, the rubber meeting the road, that we don't have a, uh, a, a process that, that um, meets judicial scrutiny. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. We have your argument. You saved time for rebuttal. May it please the court. Good morning, Your Honors. This case may be one of the few times the district court has been criticized for ruling too quickly on a motion. Most of us are more familiar with the reverse setup, the complaints that a district judge doesn't move fast enough. But this court has previously noted that district courts have wide discretion in managing their docket and different cases require rulings on different timetables. And that same principle is true here. So I'd, I'd like to start by putting the timing of this district court's ruling into context. This is a rather straightforward application for discovery in aid of foreign proceedings under 28 U.S.C. 1782 
which is a statute reflecting an over 150-year policy um, of encouraging federal court assistance in aid of foreign proceedings. There are three statutory factors that district courts must find to be met before they can grant discovery. And then for- do you think we have jurisdiction? And are, is it complicated at all by the pending motion to compel? Well, Judge Arad, the what, what has happened in this case is unfortunately a protracted attempt by the appellant to avoid discovery. So the district court, when it ruled on the motion to quash, I was already intimately familiar with the case having ruled on the application, ruled on another motion to compel involving a related party, being briefed on proceedings in Virginia where discovery had been ordered. And even after the district court denied the motion to quash, Mr. Paramo, by the way, did not move for a stay of discovery pending appeal, either in the district court or in this appellate court. And yet, despite that, just outright refused to produce any documents whatsoever. So there is a pending motion to compel saying, you know, you lost the motion to quash, you didn't move for a stay, you have to produce those documents, but I don't think Mr. Paramo's refusal to comply with the court order would deprive this court of jurisdiction. Okay, so you don't think that the court could deny the motion to compel and then this would all be moot? I, I would be surprised. I mean, it would be essentially a motion for, I mean, the, the issue with the motion to compel is that he has not complied with the court order. It would be could he order? Could he argue in that motion the same things he's arguing here, that the court order originally is not appropriate under Blanco, but the, 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 the case, the Blanco Pueblo? I mean, he, he, he should, could he argue that? I, I suppose he could try well, to get a third bite at the Wouldn't that mean that we should but. wait to see if the court realizes that perhaps it didn't, and I'm not foreshadowing, didn't com, perhaps didn't comply with Blanco Pueblo, uh, and, and I mean, I'm just wondering if we really have jurisdiction yet. I, I really would caution against that kind of precedent that simply refusing to comply with the discovery order could deprive the appellate court with jurisdiction. Good that job. would be a really perverse. Nobody's addressed this, though. This is the first time you thought of this, the both of you. The, no, the, there's been no challenge to jurisdiction okay. in the appellate briefs. This may be repetitive, but in cases such as we were, we've held a district court's denial of discovery without giving reasons is an abuse of discretion. Uh, should that not control here? WIWA is a different setup because it involved a denial of discovery, Judge Wiener. Um, at the outset, and I, I don't think this argument has been raised by the appellant, the failure to give reasons was not a point of appeal, um, but I, I did hear the appellant make that argument just now. In Rule 52A3 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure says that a district court is not required to give reasons when ruling on a motion. That is the controlling rule here. Now, in- Is that really the controlling rule here, or is the Banco Pueyo holding the controlling rule here? Banco Pueyo and, and Wiwa both addressed a different scenario. In those cases, the district court denied discovery outright and didn't even say why. Because of that denial, it triggered a fundamental right, which is the right to obtain evidence in support of your case. The subpoena was outright quashed. The district court didn't say why, didn't say how it should be modified so that a party could get discovery. And because of that, it triggered important due process rights involving, again, a party's right to present its- Wasn't the initial 1782 proceeding ex parte? It was in a way. It was an ex parte proceeding, although I, I do want to note that Mr. Paramo was notified of the proceedings and chose not to appear. Uh, chose not to contest it. But yes, that, that it was, and these are frequently done as ex parte proceedings. Well, right, well, that's, but that's, that feeds right into uh, the, the scenario we have, which is the motion to quash. Then the battle's joined, so to speak, and you have both sides of the, um, both sides of the dispute before the district court, but isn't the district court required to go back through the 1782 factors and explain both parties present, both parties arguing which side the district court's choosing. I mean, we know from the district court's order that the district court sided with your clients, denied the motion to quash, but we don't know why. I mean, we don't, we don't have anything there. We don't even, the district court doesn't even say that. We're left to infer it by the ruling. So I think this is very similar to a motion for reconsideration, for example, and this court has repeatedly held that in a motion for reconsideration, a district court is not required to go back and announce. So where's your case that again? supports that in the 1782 context? In the 1782 context, there's no cases that have been come up on this posture. 
Banco Pueo and Wheeler both involved cases where a district court granted a motion to quash, just said you don't get, to, or just denied the petition at the beginning, said you don't get discovery, and there was never any adverse briefing. And Banco Pueo, actually, the, the party who wanted the discovery never got to respond to the motion to quash. Here there was adverse briefing. Both parties got an opportunity. Mr. Paramo got an opportunity to file his motion to quash. We got an opportunity to respond. The district court had already enunciated its reasoning in granting the original application. And, and I do want to note here that the district court was intimately familiar with these issues. It had heard the original application. It had granted the discovery. It had held a hearing on a motion to compel discovery from Mr. Paramo's counsel. It had then had the briefing on the motion to quash. Part of that briefing as well was about the related proceedings that are pending in Virginia. So there's a related 1782 action in the Eastern District of Virginia where that court granted a similar, very similar discovery request against one of Mr. Paramo's shell companies. And that, that case is also on appeal. Um, and in that case, the court not only granted the discovery, it granted a motion to compel, it imposed sanctions against Mr. Paramo for failing to cooperate with discovery. It refused to stay pending appeal, noting that he was trying to dissipate assets through an auction of his, one of his most valuable properties in the United States. So this is not a typical context. This is a, a context in But how do we know all that from the district court's order? We review the district court's order, correct? That's correct. But a district court is not required to give reasons for, all, for every single order under Rule 52. You just gave a, an elegant set of reasons that if the district court had actually included in even a paragraph or whatever, we could, we could then base our ruling something on what the district court did or said. But, but here especially, the, the reply brief is cut off. The district court ruled very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I guess the local rules allow a reply brief. They don't require one. There are plenty of times where we, we don't even allow a reply brief. But certainly the, the um, proponent of the motion to quash had, I guess, the right to file or the discretion to file a reply brief, but that was cut off. I mean, when you combine the, the two things, is that problematic? I, th I don't think combining two independently acceptable things, one of which is that district courts aren't required to give reasons when denying a motion to quash, and, and that's pretty well established. And the second one is that there is no right to the reply brief under the local rules. Together, I don't think this creates create an issue particularly in this context in light of the urge, need for urgency of discovery and the repeated efforts by Mr. Paramo to just outright violate discovery orders. This was not an issue of first um, impression at that point. What's the status of the motion to compel? I mean, is it fully joined briefing back and forth? or? There, yes, there's a motion to compel that's fully briefed before the district court. Just w awaiting ruling or hearing? That's correct. Is, is there going to be a hearing? or? I, I, there isn't one scheduled. District court waiting on us, maybe? I, I would be speculating. <laughs> okay. Um, Banco Pueo 2. Am I correct that the district court there approved of the magistrate judge's order denying the motion to quash? In that case, the, the, the court granted the motion to quash. No, but, but I thought that they denied in the Banco Pueo 2 the magistrate judge. No? Did that not happen? Is that wrong? I, I, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to misstate here, so I, I'm, I'm checking, but my understanding is Banco Pueo and we were both involved. Well, the Banco Pueo 1, but the Banco Pueo 2? Okay, so, no. okay. So you believe that there is no such case where anybody denied a motion to quash? There That's is no correct. motion. There's no case anywhere. That's correct. Okay. Uh, you know, the court does not ever say in Buenco, our court in Buenco Pueyo too that it's because it would grant or deny. It doesn't reference that. It just says. Well, I think to answer that question, we have to look at the Bravo Express case, and in which I think Judge Allred, you were on the panel, which uh, explicitly notes the distinction that Rule 52A3, and this is at, at page 324 of that ruling, um, that Rule 52A3 does not require a court to give reasons when ruling on a motion, but that there is this case law created requirement to give reasons when a district court denies discovery to a party. And that's a 2015 case. Um, 
I would like to address this kind of alleged right to a reply brief from the local rules. Um, this court has repeatedly held that there is no, that district courts have broad discretion to manage their dockets. They, they simply have to be able to control their dockets to address frivolous and vexatious litigation, which frankly is what we're seeing here with someone who has repeatedly denied discovery orders, fled to the United States to escape the effect of Mexican court orders and to try to conceal assets. Um, in Saki, the, this court held that it is not error for the district court to resolve an issue promptly. And in United States versus O'Brien, the Fifth Circuit actually dismissed an appeal as frivolous um, when the appellant argued that he was denied the right to a reply brief. Neither the federal rules of civil procedure nor the local rules of the Southern District of Texas grant any right to a reply brief. The local rules of the Southern District do provide a seven-day deadline. However, they also put parties on notice that motions will be submitted to the district court at the 21-day mark, so one week before that reply is due. The local rules say the motions will be submitted without notice for decision. The appellant here relies on the judge's individual procedures um, and at times calls those local rules, and I, I think it's very important to distinguish between a local rule and an individual procedure. The local rules of the Southern District are promulgated by a majority of judges through a notice and comment procedure. This court's jurisprudence um, says that they have the force and effect of law. Individual procedures are a PDF the judge puts online to give guidance to the parties and answer commonly asked questions. They do not have the force of law and they are not adopted by majority after notice and comment. There's no statutory authorization from them. So I, I, I want to caution against the attempt by the appellant to assimilate those two documents together. Um, but in any case, the individual procedures here also don't give a constitutional due process right to a reply brief. They say pretty much the same thing as the local rules. File your reply brief within seven days. It, it's a deadline. It's not a right to have a reply brief considered in every case. Um, and the, those individual procedures also refer back to the local rules which say, which provide that deadline saying that motions will be submitted after 21 days. Um, give Judge Tipton this order. Sorry? Y'all give Judge Tipton this order that he signed. Uh, no, I don't believe that's a proposed order. And I would also note that under the abuse of discretion standard that applies here, um, the appellant was required to demonstrate some sort of prejudice resulting from his lack of reply brief. Um, there, no prejudice has been identified. We've seen the appellant say in his, his briefing and heard his counsel say just here that he would have highlighted arguments he had already made about the criminal proceedings. Um, that's simply not enough under an abuse of discretion standard to establish a showing of prejudice, saying I would have made the same arguments again, doesn't establish how he would have been harmed. And we still haven't heard, I mean, either in a mo there was no motion to consider before the district court saying, you know, hey, hey judge, like you, I, I wanted to file a reply, I had this killer argument, we haven't heard it here. Um, there's simply no briefing that appears to have been cut off. So moving then to the, Mr. Paramo's next point of appeal, which is as to the intel factors. Um, I, I would submit here at the outset, I, I think it's important to note that both in the motion to quash and in Mr. Paramo's appeal, he does not challenge the three statutory factors. And he's only actually raised challenges to two of the four discretionary factors. There's no requirement that all four discretionary factors be present and weigh in favor of discovery. So at the outset, I, I do think that a challenge to only two of the discretionary factors potentially doesn't even raise grounds for reversal under an abuse of discretion standard, given that they don't all have to be present. But if we are to analyze each of these factors and second guess the district court's decision as to each one, again, under an abuse of discretion standard, I don't think that the appellant has shown here that the district court decided these factors incorrectly. The third factor is whether the application conceals an attempt to circumvent foreign proof gathering restrictions. The Benorte parties submitted evidence, hundreds of pages of evidence and affidavits describing the Mexican civil court proceedings in which they seek to recover an over $30 million debt from Mr. Paramo. Those proceedings are pending. They were fully described in the motion. And there's no dispute that these documents would be relevant and essential for those proceedings in order to enforce the Mexican court freezing orders. Now, Mr. Paramo argued in his motion to quash that 
there, these documents are actually secretly for use in criminal proceedings and kind of describes this elaborate conspiracy in which the appellants are acting as proxy of the Mexican prosecutors to throw his client in prison. There's simply no evidence on the record of that. Is that the way criminal proceedings are often brought in Mexico, where there's a, pa a, a patron person that brings and they help fund and bring it forth? So it, I think it's the case in Mexico as it would be the case in the United States if, for example, Wells Fargo became aware of a massive international wire fraud that they do make a report to the authorities of that. Not just I believe that's what made in this victim, case. But actually participate. I, I don't think there's evidence um, on the record on appeal of what the Banorte Party's participation is in those. Um, but there is ample evidence of the intended use of these documents for the civil proceedings. I mean, the, my client is a bank. They are not a prison, really. Their main interest here is recovering money, and the only way that they're going to do that is through civil proceedings. So there's really no dispute that these documents are sought for civil proceedings, and they'd be very useful for those civil proceedings. Um, and again, there's no... If this were an American proceeding, and there were civil proceedings, those proceedings might be stayed pending the the whether or not that you know because once the horse is out of the barn uh, for the in the criminal proceedings unless they're unless they're held under seal or something um, when when we wait if this was all in the American system um, well here I, I can tell you that the Mexican court proceedings have not been stayed they've been slowed down by the fact that mr. Paramo has fled to the United States and tried to escape service of process but they well, I'm not talking not been about staying that I'm talking about the civil being stayed pending the criminal Right, and sorry, that's what I was trying to answer, that the, the civil proceedings in Mexico have not been stayed. Okay. They are ongoing. Um, and as, as to this kind of argument that there's some conspiracy and the appellants are, the, the appellees are actually working for the prosecutors, again, there's no evidence of that on the record. Mr. Paramo submitted no competent evidence whatsoever with his motion to quash that would have rebutted the hundreds of pages of evidence submitted by the Banorte parties. So I would actually submit reasoning or not. Give, it was Not only was it an appropriate exercise of discretion for the district court to resolve this issue in favor of the Banorte parties, but it would actually have been erroneous given the evidentiary record and the lack of evidence submitted by Mr. Paramo for this conspiracy. It would have been error for the district court to hold otherwise on that record. Um, the fourth factor is the sort of undue burden analysis. Um, in this one as well, I would argue the district court did not abuse its discretion in finding that the discovery sought was appropriately tailored to enforcing the Mexican court orders and tracing the assets at issue in those proceedings. The main argument we've heard from the appellant is that there'd be a burden of translating a lot of documents, and I'd like to clarify that I don't think that's an issue in any way. Mr. Paramo is a Mexican citizen. This is Mexican litigation. I understand the documents are in Spanish. Um, the, Banorte parties have not requested that those documents be translated, and I see no reason but why they the would need to. the lawyer before they, the American lawyer would have to go through it all uh, before they were produced. I do understand that there are Spanish-speaking lawyers and document reviewers in the city of Houston. Should that but I mean, they would have to pay them, and they may not be the lawyers that he's retained. I mean, lawyers always have to be reviewed. To, yeah. Lawyers always have to be engaged to review documents. I, in the context of 1782, which is a statute specifically designed to encourage federal courts to uh, provide, uh, assist in providing discovery for use in foreign proceedings, I think it's hardly surprising that documents are sometimes going to be in a foreign language. And so we would submit that that fact alone should not be considered an undue burden. Um, and it would be, I mean, these are very good arguments about the intel factors. But there's not a resolution of them in the order. There is a resolution of them. It, it simply wasn't a findings of fact and conclusions of law, which wasn't required under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I, I'm at my time, so unless there are further questions, I should step away. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Reddick. Mr. Dockery, you've saved time for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honors. <clears throat> I'll start off by saying that uh, some of the discussion of things far outside the record are probably indicative of the temperature at the district court and uh, 
what what would happen if um, without reasoned decisions from district courts for review at the appellate court, that we just get a re-argument of, of everything. We're talking about Virginia. We're talking about notification to Mexican counsel regarding uh, the initiation of the ex parte proceeding. Um, so rather than go through all of those that we dispute and, and believe there are mixed characterizations, I'll say that that foreshadows that. The, the other thing is uh, what's at stake here, which is um, there are many foreign parties uh, large banks and small ones and individuals who seek to use the United States processes. They do not have jurisdictional hooks. 1782 is that process for use in a foreign proceeding. Can we not travel under the district court's initial 1782 order and reasoning? Can you, I'm sorry. Didn't Can we not travel under the district court's initial 1782 reasoning when it, when it granted the petition for discovery? Yes. I, um, so does no, that, I think does it that might... fill in the holes that are in the district court's order denying the motion to quash? No, I don't believe it does, Your Honor. Why I, not? I think, uh, because there's no, at least, um, there's no reasoning. There's no application of law. There's no um, understanding of what the law is, whether it's complying with Banco Pueyo. But, but can, so the district court has to say, I'm not going to go back and revisit this. See my prior order. I, exactly, and I think that uh, that's can't we put that together? based on what happened here procedurally? No, I, I, th I think Benko Pueyo says you specifically should not treat the adverse proceeding as a motion to re-argue or as just a motion to quash. The, 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 um, the adverse proceeding is the start of this adversarial process for the court to make its real determination. Was Mr. Paramo um, provided notice of the ex parte proceeding? My understanding is Mexican counsel was was in some discussion with uh, Me Mexican attorneys was notified that there was going to be some process in the United States. I I never the 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 the, the local council never received notification of they know? The initiation. Did they know you were local council? I'm I'm I don't I don't know at the time of of when the ex parte application was initiated. I don't I don't know if they knew. So council opposite is incorrect that uh, that your client received notice of the 1782 petition? I believe, and I, I, I don't know if the Mexican Council received notice of the petition, of the ex parte application. Uh, that, that was, that, I believe that's the crux of their argument there. But in terms of when uh, he but I thought notice, I thought Council Opposite said that he chose not to participate. He knew about it, but didn't show. I believe that was uh, based on the communication with Mexican Council. They argued that they communicated with Mexican Council, therefore he knew about it and didn't show. But wouldn't that be enough? Wouldn't it be imputed to him? I, I don't believe serving or, or having a commu communication with foreign counsel regarding a U.S. domestic process. I, I don't know who that counsel was. Did they understand what a 1782 proceeding? Who, did they know who I was because I or the, the, the district court counsel? I, I don't believe that would be sufficient. Fortunately, we, we have rules of, of service of process which govern all of these uh, initiations of procedures and initiation of knowledge. The Mexican processes actually have uh, an entirely different uh, set of rules regarding knowledge, and it, it's uh, it's not a tag service or anything like that. It's it's something different. So I, I would argue that we should confine uh, this appeal to the U.S. rules and and this specific appeal to the the Southern District of Texas and not Virginia or or whatever else that they want want to argue. In addition, in the record regarding so was it ex parte or not? Yes, it was genuinely yes. ex parte. If did, did they have a date and a time to show up to argue it, and they failed to appear? No, that it was an ex parte application, is my understanding. Okay. And and they do not raise that argument below, is in 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 this record that there was some failure to show to a noticed hearing, that um, that they 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 acknowledge the date of service. I think all parties acknowledge the date of service and that we filed our, our – because uh, if we had been served uh, below, then we are, are t our, the clock starts on the motion to quash and the mo motion to oppose. I guess that would have happened when you got served with the subpoena. Exactly. And, and our motion to quash and motion to oppose uh, was filed within the deadline um, uh, to quash and oppose. So uh, it, in addition, there, there was um, – ample facts presented below regarding the, the, the criminal proceeding, including um, 
and and, and Benorte's involvement in the criminal proceeding regarding the jailing of Juan Jose Paramo's 85-year-old mother, uh, the oldest woman who had been incarcerated in, in this small town. It, it, um, there, there, there's lots in, in the De Novo record below uh, for, for, De, for De Novo review, but in terms of abuse of discretion, it's about what process occurred, did it comply, comply with Benko Puyo, and did the court's order reflect a genuine reasoned decision? Thank you. We have your argument. Thank you, Your Honors. This case is submitted. We appreciate the arguments of Mr. Dockery.